Hello and welcome to GameSack. In this episode, we're talking about games with pre-rendered sprites. And uh, Joe, why don't you let us know what a pre-rendered sprite is? Well, Dave, a pre-rendered sprite is, well, it's basically a graphic asset that's designed on an external workstation. Mostly back in the day, Silicon Graphics workstations, like in the case of Donkey Kong Country. Mm -hmm. And then these computer animated little model thingies are then digitized as sprites mm -hmm. and put on the console. And so they look like, you know, the graphics are like super awesome and powerful, but really they're not. <laughs> yeah, well said. I mean, that's way better than I could have explained it, but uh, let's get right into it and show you some examples. Here's Vector Man for the Genesis. The rumor is that this was Sega's answer to the popularity of Nintendo's Donkey Kong Country series. If you don't remember, we did an episode chock full of Donkey Kong Country back in 2012. In that episode, we mentioned how Donkey Kong Country was Nintendo's first title to use pre-rendered graphics built on a Silicon Graphics workstation. This made Donkey Kong Country the third best-selling title for the system, as it should be because I love that game. Sega did what they liked to do at the time and copy Nintendo's great ideas and hence Vector Man was made. Of course it had to be more mature feeling since only mature kids with lots of tude played the Genesis. And it was as the game is a run and gun set on a gritty, dirty earth that has been over polluted by humans. Robots have been left to clean up the planet but they're being reprogrammed to kill any human who returns to earth. Except for Vector Man who was away on vacation or something like that. Vector Man himself is made up of 23 body parts that work in unison to keep him running and shooting and killing rogue robots all throughout the large level. The level design is good and there's lots of secret areas for you to find if you want to go searching for them. If not, just hightail it to the end of the level, but where's the fun in that? Vector Man can collect different types of weapons and health power-ups via floating CRT monitors that are strewn throughout each level. Also, at times, Vector Man can transform into other items. He can be a drill to break through a floor. He can become a bomb and break open walls. And he can also transform into a fish-like thing that can let you swim through water faster. I remember playing this back in the day and not thinking much of it. My brother-in-law really liked it and kept telling me it was an awesome game. All I could say was, no it isn't. Well something must have happened since we used to argue about it 18 long years ago and I'm kinda changing my opinion. I'm actually really having fun playing this game. I guess I just needed to be more open-minded about it and let myself enjoy it. But as you can see the graphics haven't held up super well. The game does a lot of really cool effects but the graphics are well, they're just kinda pale. I think any game of that time, including Donkey Kong Country with pre-rendered graphics, just don't look as good as they used to. They're still fun to play, and speaking of fun to play, how about Vector Man 2? This is a good sequel to the original. It keeps the same playstyle, but adds new elements. Instead of robots, you're fighting mutant insects. There's new weapons to find and use, and new things to morph into, like the scorpion that's not bothered by hot lava. The levels are just as big and hold just as many secrets as before. A lot of activity is going on during the level, like lava cascading down everywhere, and it looks pretty good and adds to the atmosphere. Vector Man has a lot of voice samples now, and he says a bunch of stuff, and luckily it's not annoying. Oh my. And again, I had a great time playing this game. My only real complaint about both titles is the lack of a continue option. Once the game is over, it's over. Hmm, I wonder what Josh Krebs, the winner of the contest, is doing now. He's gotta be a hometown hero. Here is Skeleton Warriors from Playmates on the PlayStation. This is based on a short run cartoon and toy. The premise basically is that a powerful crystal has been split in half, turning the bad guys into living skeletons and giving you tons of power. Now you need to battle. Pretty enticing stuff. It's a 2.5D action game and as you can see all of the sprites are pre-rendered and have that weird plasticky feel to them that so many pre-rendered sprites tend to have. The movement is quick and fluid, though still awkward. Your job is to hack the enemies to bits with your sword. And your sword can shoot blue things if you have enough of these gem items in stock. You can also swing your sword without firing with another button if you want to conserve your ammo. Once you kill them, pieces of their pre-rendered sprite will float around and start to come back together. In order to finish them off for good, you need to collect their soul, aka the power-up they drop before they come back together. This is usually a shot or a health increase, but most of the times they only increase your amount by one. 
If you don't get the power up in time, the enemy reforms and you'll have to fight him again. And all enemies take a few hits to defeat. It's not annoying though, usually. The boss fights are pretty easy, though you'll have to fight most at least twice as they tend to come back together and there's nothing you can do to prevent it. Every once in a while, you'll be forced to ride a hover bike which basically is a poor man's burning force, which itself is basically a poor man's space harrier. You just fly slowly along shooting the enemies and collecting the power-ups. The graphics here are pretty bad. I mean, why is the land breathing? Even though it's solid, it looks like it's moving, like water. The visuals in the 2.5D segments are much better with no blockiness or polygon warping. I mean, come on, the pre-rendered sprites look kind of silly, but that's to be expected. Otherwise, the game is extremely dark. The music is pretty good, but at the same time slightly disappointing. And the only reason I say disappointing is that because the magazine Game Fan really hyped the hell out of this game and especially its soundtrack back in the day. It's definitely good, but it's not the end-all be-all musical score that I expected back when I initially rented the Saturn version. That's right, it's on the Saturn as well, and that version actually has a few graphic effects that are missing here, like transparent fog in a few stages. I wish I could have shown the Saturn version instead of this one for the review, but alas, I don't have it. Overall, the game plays fairly well. Usually you won't have an issue doing what you want to do, but sometimes it can get a little chaotic as you don't know what's hitting you, or sometimes things will even shoot at you from off screen. Also, your dude can hang from ceilings and this can get wonky, making some of the stages like this one kind of annoying. And the camera can be a little floaty and slow to follow, which can add to the annoyance. But again, it's not horrible, it's just a little annoying. It's worth having for cheap if you can find it, and now I need to go find the Saturn version. we're off to a good start and there's a couple of really good examples of pre-rendered sprites and even backgrounds mm, pre-renderedness love it mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, let's just keep going this is soul divide for the playstation from psycho and of course it's a shooter it's definitely not the prettiest game around, and the pre-rendered sprites are a mixed bag. Everything looks just jagged and washed out. Your character sprite is big for a shooter, but when it comes to detail, it's hard to make anything out. Hell, this goes for most enemies as well. Bosses are the exception, as they're all fairly large and you can see the details in them, and they also animate nicely. I really wanted to like this game as it had a lot going for it. Your character can shoot a projectile for long-range attacks and can use a sword or a spear for close melee attacks. You also have a bunch of magic that you can use. The first four types on your magic scroll will deplete a magic bar when used. This can be refilled by doing melee attacks. The rest of the magic has to be obtained via icons dropped by enemies you kill. You can choose from three characters and their abilities vary slightly. One is good with long range attacks but weak with melee and another is the opposite, good at close range while not so good at long range. The third character is supposed to be right in the middle. Honestly, it didn't matter what character I chose as I had the same problems with all of them. Or I mean the problem is most likely me. Enemies take a huge amount of hits before they decide that it's time to die. Shooting at them takes forever and before you know it, you have one or two coming in close to fight you face to face. This sucks as well since slashing them with your spear takes just as long to kill them. You might as well be using a wooden spoon and hope they die from a splinter. But you can perform a very powerful slash attack. It sounds easy as all you do is push up or down diagonally and hold in the cut button. But it's far from easy to do on a consistent basis. For one, as you're pushing diagonally up or down, your character will fly in that direction, which means you're going to fly directly into your enemies. Then, as per the instruction manual, you have to hold the cut button for a long time. Really? So I'm supposed to fly into my enemies while holding down this button hoping the attack will come off like I want it to? When you are able to pull it off, it does a lot of damage, but it's way too undependable to rely on. One good thing is that you do have a decent sized life bar, so you'll be able to take quite a bit of abuse. Another thing is the levels are insanely short. You barely have enough time to start enjoying the backgrounds and tough enemies before you reach the end. Seriously, you won't spend more than a minute on a level, excluding the last one which is probably three minutes, but I don't know because I haven't beaten it. What I think is the last level has a lot of enemies broken up by at least three boss fights that I encountered. 
You can get a little life back from dropped icons here and there, but not enough to keep you going until the end. Again, I'll say that I'm not good at shooters, and I'm sure that some people have beaten this game with no problem. I wish I had the skills to do that, or at least the patience to keep trying. Who knows, maybe someday I'll try it again, but eh, it probably won't be anytime soon. Johnny Bazooka Tone on the Saturn is one of the worst games I've ever had the displeasure of playing. I remember it being advertised in a lot of the magazines back in the day. You're Johnny, trapped in the year 2050 where apparently there's no sun because this game is incredibly super dark. Just about everything here is pre-rendered and it looks awful. I wonder if it's so dark because they couldn't afford the advanced lighting that they'd need to make daytime stages. Actually, I have a feeling that it might be a little easier to make pre-rendered sprites look better if you keep things kind of dark. Anyway, this game plays as a crappy run-a-gun slash collect-a-thon. You have a guitar which doubles as your gun. You even have a super weapon that you can wind up and release, but it takes forever. And you can also use your gun to help slow your fall after a jump, and this will help you cross wide gaps. Thanks to the incredibly inept stage design, it's hard to tell what you can stand on and what you can't. Same goes with what can hurt you and what doesn't. There really isn't a moment of fun to be had here. You'd think that a game starring a music dude with a guitar would at least have a great soundtrack, but even that is rather underwhelming. I mean, the music really isn't that bad or anything, but it certainly does not fit an action game. This one is also available on the PlayStation, 3DO, and PC if you want to suffer on those platforms too. Not much better is Doom Troopers Mutant Chronicles for the Super Nintendo. It's also on the Genesis. It's based on a card trading game or some nonsense like that. The story is that you're fighting the enemies of the Mega Corporation and you set off to blah 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 seriously nobody cares. You choose between one of two pre-rendered heroes and you embark on your adventure. Right away you see that the game is pretty violent with lots of blood all over the place for no reason. It plays like a broken run and gun where your gun is actually assigned as a secondary weapon until you switch the controls. The enemies are all bullet sponges and will continue shooting directly at you even after their heads have exploded or fallen off. And the only way to hit an enemy is to get directly into their line of fire as well. Along the way, you'll collect ammo and health refills. You can also get a limited special weapon. You can only aim up or down if you hold the R shoulder button and your crappy looking pre-rendered character is in no hurry to change firing directions for you. The level design sucks, and so do the boss designs. Take the level 1 boss here. You can't shoot him by standing directly below him, I mean of course not. Why would you be able to do that? You can only shoot him by firing diagonally, which puts you right in the path of the bones he tosses. Not only that, but the green slime on the floor constantly depletes your life. I was able to beat him, but I went through my entire stock of lives to do it. Sometimes you'll even run into traps like this thing. I don't know what's going on, but I can't move or do anything. Eventually I'm able to break free, but the controls are backwards! Yes, always a wise decision by the developer to make the players smile as they play your game. The graphics are decent in spots, but the pre-renderedness doesn't help. The music can be kinda cool though. The game is tough and honestly not tremendously enjoyable. I think I would have liked it more when I was 13 or 14 because the blood and the extreme violence would have made me feel cool and rebellious. Well, I'm not that angsty anymore, so this game really doesn't have much to offer me. Honestly, Joe, I have absolutely no idea how Johnny Bazooka Tone got the green light, but what the hell's wrong with that guy? What's wrong uh, with that game? I mean, you already explained it, but... Kinda. But yeah, yeah, just, just don't play it. But we've, we've got a few more to go, so let's finish this up. Make your body rock. Make your body rock.
Killer Instinct by Rare and Midway started out in the arcades in 1994. I remember a local mall called Westminster Mall had a pretty decent arcade back at this time. The pre-rendered graphics were new and looked amazing and the fighters seemed way more diverse than Street Fighter or even Mortal Kombat. In 1995, Nintendo released a dumbed down version for the Super Nintendo. A lot of stuff was cut out to fit onto the SNES cartridge. Stages went from 3D to 2D, FMV after a fight was removed and replaced with a still image. Zooming in and out of a fight was also removed. But hey, to make up for all this, Nintendo included a CD with remixed music from the game. Mmm, sorry about that guys, Joe made me do it. The pre-rendered sprites remained, although they were a lot smaller and had less animation from their arcade counterpart. Still though, the game looked pretty good for the time. A lot of people were impressed and I was one of them. I was especially happy when they left in the announcer's voice. I always loved when he would scream out different combos I'd lay on my opponents, but not as much as when one was laid on me. <laughs> Speaking of combos, that's definitely the bread and butter of this game. Instead of doing just piddly punch and kick moves, you waited for your chance to start a combo. If you got it going, you did your best to get that combo as high as possible. I was never really good at this, even though I tried and tried. I'd always get a monster combo around 10 hits or so, and that would be it. I had one friend who could do a lot better and would get an ultra combo quite a bit. Very much like the computer just did to me right there! It was also really cool to have finishing moves like in Mortal Kombat. The thing is, being that it's a Nintendo game, you weren't going to get any of the gore that you saw in Mortal Kombat. Still, it was always fun pulling off these moves. I had a lot of fun with this game back in the day. Ready. In 1996, Nintendo released Killer Instinct Gold for the N64. This was based on Killer Instinct 2 in the arcades. Again, it was slightly dumbed down because of the N64's cartridge limitations. A lot of new characters were added and a few were taken out. Thunder was one of my favorite characters in the first game and he got the axe. Slight pun intended. The biggest problem with playing Killer Instinct Gold is that you have to use the N64 pad. That thing isn't exactly comfortable when playing a fighting game with a directional pad. And the smaller sizes of the C buttons is also annoying. But Dave, why don't you use the third party controller? Only OEM for me, baby. I guess if you're playing it long enough, you'll be able to get used to it. The pre-rendered sprites look way better here. They're fairly clean, even though every character looks like they're made out of plastic. The animation is good, although it's missing some frames compared to the arcade game. Overall, it's not a bad port and is definitely the best fighting game for the system. And that's not saying a lot. One game people rarely think of when it comes to pre-rendered sprites is Viewpoint on the Neo Geo. The game uses an isometric perspective, which looks cool, but it also means that you don't have much room to move around on screen. The graphics don't have that typical silicon graphics pre-rendered look, which, in my opinion, makes them look a little bit more pleasant. It sometimes gives the impression that the Neo Geo is handling polygons, which it really can't do at all. Even the Genesis is more powerful at polygons, mainly because of the way the graphics are engineered despite using a similar chipset for the CPUs. The music in this one is kind of interesting, and it has a few good tracks. they definitely upped the pre-renderedness when Electronic Arts ported this game to the PlayStation. No one ever mentions this version. Even the backgrounds are super shiny looking. I do like a lot of the upgrades here, but it slows down a lot. That's because the PlayStation can't handle the power of a 1992 Neo Geo game. They even changed the music for some reason. I'm not gonna lie, I kind of like it, even though it's all in mono. The game is still hard as balls, though. Did you just say tits? Oh, I said balls, idiot. 
The very best thing, though, is that each and every time you die, you get to stare at a loading screen for 10 seconds, which only enhances your enjoyment of the game. Finally, even puzzle games weren't exempt from pre-renderedness, as we can see in Sega's Baku Baku Animal for the Saturn. This is a basic tile-falling puzzle game where you don't just need to match up the color, but also the animal and the food. So, for example, the monkeys will eat the bananas, the panda the bamboo, the mice the cheese, the dogs will eat the bones, and so on. You can have a huge collection of the same colored animals or the same colored foods all clumped together, but they won't disappear until you have an animal to eat it all. One animal can eat a ton of food, and one piece of food can feed two animals if the pieces are set up correctly. Unfortunately, I'm not a huge fan of puzzle games, because stuff like this happens where a bunch of random blocks piles up to the ceiling and then I lose. Just leave me in peace, I'm having a hard enough time on my own! So that kind of ruins the single player experience for me, but otherwise it's fun. The pre-rendered graphics use is light, mainly devoted to the chomping animals and the random character in the center of the screen. And that's the way it should be, in my opinion. It's not a bad puzzle game, and I really like the idea behind it, but it's probably way better to play against another person. Okay, well there you go. There's some examples of games in that graphical style, and uh, of course we didn't cover every game that features pre-rendered graphics. Like, we've already talked about Experts on the Genesis, which looks absolutely horrid, and, yeah. and there are plenty of other examples out there, and why don't you let us know what kind of examples you like or think are just ridiculous. But... Dave, yes. what do you think of pre-rendered graphics? I Back in the day, I was all goo goo gaga for them. I liked really? them. I did. I was really? like, Donkey Kong Country thought it looked freaking amazing. And I know you never, ever really thought they looked no, good. I, I was never <laughs> impressed. I thought they no. always looked kind of grainy and cheesy, personally. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I feel now. I mean, yeah. there's some nostalgia to some of the games, but overall, they just don't look that good. Yeah, and like I said, let us know what games you like in the style, and thanks for watching GameSack. Did you know that Horizon Chase Turbo is now available on the Nintendo Switch? Oh my god! I didn't! What is this game? Let's take a look at the game. Wow, that looks just like Top Gear, but for the future! And Dave, they even sent us t-shirts to celebrate! I love t-shirts! Whoa, okay, they sent medium shirts, but I think I look okay. Yeah, medium? I mean, what do you think, I'm 12 years old or something? Dude, judging by what I see on top there, you are not 12 years old. Oh, nice, a bald Joe. Way to be baldophobic, Joe. Horizon Chase Turbo, now available on the Nintendo Switch.